Can that mean you're in charge? We'll now call the uh, Jacksonville City Council to order for the uh, joint meeting here today. Call the uh, Audley County Board of Commissioners to order for this uh, uh, February the 20th uh, special meeting with the city of Jacksonville. Thank you everybody for coming and being with us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this chat. Uh, we have, a, Mr. Chairman, we have a, a agenda, I believe, that we've worked out here. Uh, and I would uh, go to my the members of the council and uh, ask for a motion to adopt the agenda. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Same here. Um, I uh, ask for a motion from the Board of Commissioners to approve the uh, agenda items that's before us here. Need a motion? So moved. And a motion and a second. second. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed? Any discussion? Should have did that first. Yeah. All right. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Bright uh, and the Board of County Commissioners for uh, hosting uh, tonight's meeting uh, with us here. Uh, like I said, we have this uh, the agenda for tonight, and I believe the uh, first issue that's going to be presented will be on mental health challenges, and this will go to, to uh, Interim County Manager David Cotton. David. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, tonight we will be uh, discussing mental health challenges, where we are, in, in the process of studying that. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll move on to downtown Jacksonville update as, as well as parking opportunities. And then we'll close out by discussing our water front park uh, conversion. We have some good news. It does look like the uh, federal government is going to allow us to transfer those grant restrictions to the new property. Oh, good. Um, so first things first of all, I'll call on Sherry Slater to give us an update on Sorry, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, we have for some time recognized in our community a, a challenge or a need that we have regarding our mental health services um, that are available to our citizens. One of those primary needs is for us to have a community-based uh, facility that provides crisis services to include detox and to serve um, for involuntary commitment uh, petitions that are that are served in our community. Um, we recognize that not having that facility local causes us uh, lots of other issues with law enforcement time spent, um, with social work time spent, and, and many other ways that that trickles down into expenses and uh, waste in, in terms of our other resources. So along with um, Carteret County, our neighbor that we've worked with for many years on mental health uh, initiatives, we have uh, with our MCO, Trillium Health Resources, we've had a work group meeting for several months now. Um, again, that has included uh, Onslow County, Carteret County commissioners have been involved as well. Um, both hospitals in Carteret County and in Onslow have, have been on that committee with us. Um, and recently we were able to add uh, Chief Unero from the city uh, to that committee as well to, to help talk about what our resources are and what options we have. Um, the committee has done a good deal of work on how we could go about getting a facility in Onslow County. And I'll give you just a little bit of a brief of where we are on that. We are exploring um, the facility that used to be a detox center here in the community um, on Memorial Drive. We have, have done a site review of that um, to determine what sort of condition the building is in. And we have some preliminary answers on that. Um, we've also had some conversations with the Division of he Health Service Regulation, which is the state agency that would license um, any provider that would uh, come in and provide that service for us. So they have some regulations for what has to be, um, how the building has to be set up and that sort of thing as well. Um, Mr. Cotton and the commissioners asked me to provide a, a bit of a timeline. Um, there are a few gaps in our timeline, things that I can't yet um, provide you, but I can give you a little bit of, of information based on what I have. So I'll go ahead and do that and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, again, the work group has been meeting for several months and I think we've made some good progress. Um, the first step after what we've done so far, which is have our local building inspectors look at the building just as a cursory review, would be to have to request that the Division of Health Service Regulation do a construction review. Um, 
depending on what that review turned up would depend on how long the renovations, what the extent of renovations and how long those would take. Um, if it was determined, the building is not sprinkled, sprink, sprinklered, um, which is the primary concern we have. If it doesn't need to be sprinklered, um, then the renovations are relatively minor and could be done in a month or two, perhaps. If it does need to be sprinklered, we'd be looking at more extensive time because there, there are uh, engineer things that have to be done as well as um, the, ex the extent of that kind of work takes longer. So we'd be looking at, um, it, you know, the range would be more like four to five months for those renovations. Um, the request for proposals for a provider to actually come in and run that service would come through Trillium Health Resources. They would actually be the one that would do the RFP. Um, that process for them is a 60-day process. Once proposals are then received, um, they would take 30 days to review the proposals, and then um, their credentialing process and contracting process, they think, would take about another 30 days. At that point, we would be looking at, um, again, it would go back to the State Division of Health Service Regulations for their uh, licensing of that provider in that particular facility. And their timeline is... Uh, something that I don't have yet. I'm waiting for their response on what that timeline would, what their general turnaround is for a licensure. So we're looking at somewhere on the low side of about seven months and on the high side of closer to, to 10 or 11 months, depending on the extent of the renovations that would be necessary. All that's assuming that the proper funding and, and um, agreements could be worked out among the parties that are um, participating. Would yes. this be a bed facility also? As in an overnight facility, sir? Or outpatient? It would, be a, it would be an overnight facility. They would be able to keep um, patients um, longer than 24 hours. Or 23, I think, is the standard for non-inpatient. Sure. So explain the relationship between Trillium and the provider. Would they be working for Trillium? Not technically, sir. Trillium is um, this... The way that the State Division of Health and Human Services has set up mental health services in our state is that there is a managed care organization uh, that determines um, what services will be brought into the region. It is a regional system. Obviously, we're interested in our local community, but it's a regional system. Um, and we're part of um, 24 counties right now. There are other counties that have asked to join Trillium, so that number may change in the, in the near future. Um, but the regional system, Trillium determines what services are brought in, and that's how they, can, they contract with providers to provide those different services. Is that because the funding is coming from the state to provide that? Or is it, it, I guess what I'm wondering is, for me, and I've been involved somewhat with it, um, I don't think that Trillium has been providing the services that our community uh, needs or has needed. And I think there's others that would agree with that. Um, and that's gone on for some time. I know we've had some meetings with Trillium representatives. We've identified the issues. And we've never really gotten any results back from the leadership at Trillium. And so while this is a great idea, I'm concerned that it's still the same mechanism and not a separate mechanism. Sure. So there are a couple of different things in that, sir. Um, one is, in order for the facility to accept um, state dollars or Medicaid dollars, they have to be credentialed through Trillium. That's part of the state system. So any um, provider that came in to provide a mental health service that was not credentialed through Trillium would not be able to accept anything other than private insurance unless they were fully funded by um, some other entity like a government or a nonprofit entity. Um, so if, for the sake of uh, the way that a facility is um, the cost uh, analysis for a facility is set up through a, a myriad of funding streams. Um, Trillium and state, state and Medicaid dollars would be some of those. Uh, private insurance would also be some of those. So a facility to be successful, we believe, would need to be able to accept Medicaid um, and state dollars through Trillium, as well as to be able to accept private insurance um, funding as well. And we also miss a huge portion of the population if we don't have a facility that can serve those people who would be state or Medicaid uh, patients. I think, I think there's a lot of lack of clarity on, 
on what truly, who truly it really is, and they are a contract. They are contracted by the state of North Carolina, correct? Yes, sir. To handle sir. Medicaid. Uh, yes, sir, and they don't provide the service. They they manage the contracts that provide the service. The providers are... Um, they get are, the money and then they contract out the services. Yes, sir. They, they pay providers to provide the service. Yes, sir. Um, so now, we're doing well, we're suffering. So Trillium has been our MCO for about 20 months, um, a little over a year and a half. Um, and I know that there are still a lot of things that can be improved upon, and that's one of the things we're working on now. Um, we have gotten additional um, mobile crisis companies in town since Trillium took over. Um, prior, under our old MCO, we had one um, uh, mobile crisis or um, community crisis organization um, and there was a lot of negative feedback on on that one particular um, organization um, one thing that we have now is we have multiple uh, community crisis um, crisis response organizations in the community that are able to provide that service so that for at least for our county departments that are responding has been an improvement there's still a long way to go absolutely um, so we still are looking for ways to improve, uh, improve response time and, and responsiveness in general. But, but we have seen some improvement for sure. Um, we definitely want to see more in the facility-based crisis center, um, which some folks call detox, facility-based crisis, just sort of our, the, new, the new word for it, um, is what, one of the ways that we're trying to address that. Um, and the step in the right direction, at least, is that Trillium certainly has been at the table with us, helping to um, coordinate this effort between the, the communities. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, Mr. Who, who, uh, who would own the building? The building belongs to the county, sir. Okay. Who, who then measures the effectiveness of, of what we're doing? The, you know, the, the provider that comes in that's hired through Trillium or, or at least vetted through, through Trillium, Who's, who do they answer to? So that's a very good question, sir. I'm glad you asked. Um, there are a couple of opportunities for us in this. Um, one thing that, that our work group expressed to Trillium is we would like to be part of the RFP process, the request for proposals. We would like to participate in how that's written to sort of define what that would mean. Um, we would define what, what, we, what service we want um, and expect and when, what parameters or measurements under which we would consider that successful. Another opportunity is that it could be set up with a community board. Um, there's the opportunity for um, us, and when I say us, I'm, I am also including Carteret and, and their um, participants, uh, for us as a group to set up some sort of advisory um, board that would then be able to oversee that they're actually measure, measuring and meeting the so, goals that we've set. Similar to Osa Memorial with this, uh, basically a semi-independent board that's got input and oversight from the county commissioners. And could, yes, sir, and could report back to the various um, entities that, that it represents. I, I, I think I speak for the community when I say if it hadn't been for Alzo County's oversight of the hospital board, no telling where the hospital would be today. And I think it would definitely be in Alzo County's best interest if y'all had the same oversight and responsibilities that you did similar to Alzo Memorial, I think. But, you know, originally, for the council of history on mental health, the county did have our own freestanding mental health. That was the, uh, that we got reimbursements through Medicaid and from the state and federal government. Then the state, uh, later on made a ruling that your population had to be 300,000 so, or more. So at that time, we had to uh, merge with Carteret County come Oslo Carteret Behavioral Health, and it ran pretty good. Uh, Carteret County was using our detox center, the sheriff's office, and uh, our law enforcement was using it. And then uh, in 2008, uh, the state come out and said you got to have a bigger catchment area. You got to merge with, uh, you know, with more people. You got to have at least a 500,000 uh, population. So we ended up going with Brunswick, uh, New Hanover, Pender, uh, Carteret, and uh, Onslow, and that became Coastal Care. And at that time, in Coastal Care, when it was merged with them in 2008, the state uh, come down and looked at the uh, facility that we had and said. 
it don't meet the criteria of a detox facility, so you're going to have to take toe coastal care. You're going to have to close it. So after closing that, that's when the problem started to begin here. And I don't think that was all of the problem, but that was uh, a beginning of the problem when it put all the uh, people that was needing help at the hospital emergency rooms and in the custody of our sheriff and our law enforcement folks and burdening them to not be able to do their job. Now, I think the chief uh, I talked with or, or, or heard chief talk about the impact for the city, which is right at a million dollars in officers that's being used. We've got an item on our agenda tonight that's mental health related where our uh, foster care has almost doubled because of people on substance abuse at the uh, Department of Social Services will not let them have those kids back. And now we've got to come up with the money to fund those foster care. It went from 160 something to 200 and something kids that's in foster care because we can't put them back to their family. Now, what Ms. Slater was referring to and uh, Commissioner Knapp went with me to the meeting with Trillium and uh, the second the, uh, assistant uh, director for Trillium out of Greenville, David Tart, I think you've met with him one time before. Uh, they, they wanting to get that crisis center back. They wanting to help us get detox back. But the price tag minus the building, they, without, if they didn't have a facility, this is a total different price, but minus the facility to put the operational and maintenance of a facility to handle a uh, I believe it was a uh, 12, I looked at a 12 person bid, which was bigger than what we had, would be $1.6 million. Now that's what it would be for operational costs for every year with the personnel it would take to man that. And then we'd have to be approved by Trillium to be a provider or who, whoever they put in there as a provider. And that would take a lot of pressure off of law enforcement, it would take a lot of pressure off the sheriff's office, it would take a lot of pressure off a lot of people that's involved in trying to solve this problem. The county of Onslow, we contribute to Trillium every year and there's no uh, mandate that we can contribute except we do have to contribute. There's no numbers. We contribute to them $500,000 a year we give to Trillium to, to help manage our mental health and our facility. The uh, building that we uh, have over at Center Street is another building that Trillium occupies. And I think the rent on that that we get from that is $135,000 a year. So we actually back out the 135,000 out of the 500,000 that we give them. My question to them and Sherry was there and Commissioner Knapp was there. My question to Trillium was, what about taking the 500,000 that the county contributes to, to your program and apply that to this $1.6 million and earmark it for Onslow County to bring a facility back here. Now, there's, everybody knows about the problem, but you gotta have money to fix this and we're gonna have to have some partners to do that. Uh, Craven, uh, I'm sorry, Carteret County uh, Hospital has said they want to contribute. Craven or uh, Carteret County Commissioners have said they want to contribute because they, they were using the facilities for, before. I've talked to Penny Burlingame at Onslow Memorial. She said that uh, Onslow Memorial would like to contribute because it's a big impact on, on their resources and they'd rather see the money being spent to actually treat it than to you know, have them in a facility that don't uh, uh, address those problems and get our law enforcement officers back on the road where they belong. Now that's where, kind of where we're at with it. Um, I'd like to see that detox center open back up and even if it's, uh, you know, it's, we're going to have to address this problem because somebody said, well, it don't, it don't really affect me, but it affects all of us when, when we got uh, double the amount of kids in foster care and we having to pay for that out of tax, out of the you know, tax money, and the city of Jacksonville is paying a million dollars or, or their resources being taxed a million dollars. So it is hurting, and that money don't grow on trees, it comes from taxpayers. So we gotta, the, the only way I know to fix it and get a handle on it is to uh, get Trillion, and they are a, our um, 
Medicaid providers. Now, out of the $1.6 million, they would collect uh, their estimated collection would be 600 and 600,000 and some change they would collect from re Medi Medicaid reimbursement. Now, people that's indigent that don't have any insurance, uh, it wouldn't, uh, that would be um, a cost that would be burdened by the facility. So, yes, as, as Chairman uh, Bright indicated, the, the cost to run the facility would be about 1.6 million. Some of that would be reimbursed um, through revenues, either through private insurance, which would be a very small number. Um, private insurance does not pay well for this type of crisis center. Um, so, so they could expect some revenue from private insurance, but not the, not the lion's share. Um, the Medicaid and state dollars that would pay would fund a, a portion of it. Um, and as Chairman Bright said, some, some indigent folks might be covered under the state Medicaid dollars and some might not. Um, but there are there are other um, there are no other funding sources besides the state dollars, the Medicaid dollars, and then uh, what minimal amount private insurance would cover. So it would leave uh, almost 1.1 million for um, others of us, presumably, to um, to make up the difference in order to keep a facility here um, operational. And what we, what we really don't want to do is have a facility come that can't be successful and then we lose it again. Um, so that's sort of the reason for having the, as much of the work put in up front to make sure that we know what we're getting into if we do this and that we have a good plan. Let me, let me say something about this. Um, it's kind of want to echo what Jack said about um, trying to find a way to fund this case. The first question I had was, you know, I don't understand how that facility has been vacant since 2012. That was my first thing. I mean, Coastal Care left there and it's been, the building has been kind of abandoned uh, there for since 2012. And what I don't understand is why this hasn't been, you know, placed as a priority beforehand because it is an issue. It's an ongoing issue. It should be the number one concern of both the city council and the county commissioner. They had a long, lengthy meeting with uh, Chief Yanero and we discussed some things and looking at stats and figures, and I really do appreciate that. Uh, and I know he's got a deep vested interest in this as well because it's affecting everybody across the board. And I'm kind of glad that we're having this meeting because you know I feel that we should work together, you know, to, to solve a common problem that we're that we're all experiencing. But getting back to what you said too, Bob, I mean I think that's great too as far as an oversight committee is concerned to make sure the providers are doing what they're supposed to do because I still have a question. I'll be very honest and very candid. Why wasn't there something there since 2012? You know, that I took a tour with uh, Sherry of that building, and I was, I'll be honest with you, I was pretty uh, upset when I walked in that building. The, the building facility is nice. I don't think a lot of county or city officials ever took a tour of that building in the last five to six years. The building can be refurbed. It's going to save us a lot of money if we can bring it up to code, so long as we can provide an adequate provider in there that, that we can monitor because. You know, this prob problem that affects the sheriff's department, that affects the uh, police department, but affects families and affects all the citizens around here. I mean, we have a major problem. I think that we need to we need to address that. And I, I think it's just becoming a fact with some of these providers that there is a problem out there after years of, in my opinion, of not really recognizing it. So I'm hoping that we can come up with a way somehow to find the adequate provider, to get the uh, adequate funding that we need to get this up and running. Because you know what? It is a concern. It's a concern of mine. It's a concern of Sheriff Miller. It's a concern of Chief Yanero. And I thank everybody in here. So. And I echo everything you said, Robin. And I, and I think it should be our number one priority. And if you look at communities, if you do a comparison of communities of our populace, in comparison, we're probably one of the only ones with a population of our size that does not have a facility. Others our size have two and three, and we have zero. And that's concerning because we have a lot of young military families, we have exiting military families, members that have served two, three, four tours that don't have any benefits because they're not retired, and we can't give the proper care in our communities, and we're watching families be destroyed by this horrific uh, drug abuse and mental illness that, that exists today. And it's a shame that there's no option but either the emergency room or jail. I echo what you're saying because that is absolutely spot on. If, if, 
thing is, I spent 22 years working for NCIS on base, okay? Through that time, you've had several wars, deployments, and things of that nature. You, there, we, I've seen an increase in, in drug use and abuse and narcotics trafficking around this area. They talk about heroin. Heroin's been here since I got here in 1990. It's just now recently surfing because it's hitting home. Everybody knew that Wilmington was the, the entry city of heroin into North Carolina. I mean, at least all the LEOs knew that. But the thing is, is we have a population here of Marines, and a lot of them get discharged or retire here, and they're carrying some of their problems out into the community. And I echo you, we can't help them. You know, if you're in active duty or you're retired, you have the benefit of the VA, uh, you have the benefit of on-base medical, or whatever it might be, okay? Now the military will send their people out to some, some good facilities, but the rest of us were squandering. And the thing is, you look at all the crime that is committed, if you did a statistical study on the crime, the majority of crimes are either caused by somebody, one, somebody who's mental, mentally ill or is abusing narcotics. And in the last five years of my career before I retired, the prescription medication problem just went through the roof. You know, I've literally tracked people who have been addicted in dealing in this stuff, moving up to the next level of heroin, going into Wilmington and buying bindles and bindles and bindles of heroin, not only selling it, but using it, and it's a shame. So I think, I think it's, it's going to take a concerted effort, not just with the county commissioners. It's going to take a concerted effort of the city council to work together to find a way, because, you know, you're the, you're the county seat, you know. Most of the people live in Jacksonville, and it affects a lot of these people here in Jacksonville, not just Sneeds Ferry or anywhere else. So I think it's imperative that we work together and find a way to do this, because I have a passion for it. You know, my wife is into substance abuse prevention as well. And it's sickening to see these people not getting the treatment that they need or people that have been diagnosed with, with mental illness not able to, to go to a facility and receive the proper care because there's not a proper provider there to give them that care. And I think what, what people want is they want a short-term answer. Let's do short-term uh, treatment. It's not gonna, re it's, it, that's not enough because you have short-term and you have long-term treatment that we have to follow up with and try to help these people because believe me, a lot of these citizens these drug users, so, so to speak, that keep rotating through our jails, they can be rehabbed if it properly treated and then let go and get back on the streets and do their thing as a normal citizen. But they don't have that opportunity. I agree, I agree totally with you, Robin. Uh, one of the things I was just thinking is maybe perhaps it's good a, a time to put together maybe a, a county and city task force to look further into this and maybe come up with some answers and, uh, numbers. and numbers and see what we got to work with, who the partners are that we can bring in. Uh, and, you know, I mean, you know, you're talking about the city could say, you know, we, we spent a million dollars a year on dealing with this situation. If we can save money by being a partner and contributing some to this process, perhaps it works out well for us too and everybody else involved. I mean, we, it's something you're going to have to, you're, we're going to have to kick it in the butt and get it started. Absolutely. Well, we'll... Um, I have a question. One population that I have not heard anyone address tonight, including any information from Trillium, what are you doing about children and adolescents in terms of their mental health, in terms of their psychosis, diagnosis that they're dealing with, I'm pretty sure the same way that Camp Lejeune schools are dealing with it, Onslow County schools are dealing with it. So what type of services are we talking about for children and adolescents under 18 years of age that may not necessarily be substance abusers, but they also have other mental health, itch, um, mental health illnesses that also will require them to also have inpatient facility treatment. And I know that we have Bryn Mawr, but Bryn Mawr is private. So if you do not have insurance or if your parents cannot afford the day-to-day -day costs, what services are we currently providing to children's and adolescents for Onslow County. So, and, and that, I'm sorry, ma'am, that would be a question better answered by a Trillium staff member. Um, I will do my best. I know that we work with them closely to get um, services that we, where we see gaps. Um, we recently have participated in their gaps and needs survey, which they do every year to talk about things that we feel are missing in the community um, or that need to be beefed up a bit. So um, our Department of Social Services 
has regular contact because that's where from a county standpoint we see the majority of, of the folks that you're speaking about. That's where we get that contact. Um, so our Department of Social Services has regular contact with the Trillium office locally um, about things that we need and things that are missing. Um, again, I completely agree there are lots of gaps in, in the um, service provision here for that population. Um, we still experience long wait times for placements um, when we have particularly our foster children who need a, a type of placement. We struggle to find appropriate placements. Um, placements obviously are different for youth than they are for adults. Um, there's different requirements, different licensing. Um, so we, there are not as many entities that are licensed to provide that service to young people. Um, and it's a very expensive service. So it is a difficult thing for us to, when we need to place a child, we do experience longer wait times than we wish we did. Um, which is why we do have those regular meetings to talk about things that are missing and things that we need. Um, we have had better luck under Trillium getting those placements than we had under our prior provider, um, but still we, still we do experience gaps. So that is something that we work with them on regularly to try to get additional services. We are not at a place right now to try to get a facility in the community um, just for youth. Um, I know that it, a youth organization did look at the building that we're talking about um, about 18 months ago. Um, but the cost to renovate it for their particular type of license was prohibitive for them to be able to come and do business. Did that answer your question, maybe? No, I'm about the task force idea, maybe working with the county as far as you know, our, our folks working with them to come up with a solution here. Mayor, members, of chairman, uh, certainly David and I have talked about this along with Sherry and along with Mike. A uh, task force is a good idea because it's not going to be solved by one agency. I would like to ask Mike, if he would, to give you an overview of the million dollars, because this is not cash we're spending, it's time. So in the interest of time, three minutes, Mike. Three minutes. Um, in, in fact, as I drove over here, we have uh, two officers at Onslow Memorial Hospital with an IVC. We have two other officers who are uh, working on an attempted suicide. So just to talk about the gravity of the program, uh, the, the problem that we have, I mean, those, those are four officers, and they'll probably be tied up two to three hours with each of those processes as they, as they try to, to, to resolve both of those situations. So we're, we're spending an inordinate amount of time on these particular calls. And I think, you know, the thing that keeps me up at night is that um, as I look around the country, 50% of all police shootings are people that are mentally challenged. So that concerns me. It concerns me for the young officers that we have working for us. It concerns me for the simple fact is that the officers are not equipped to deal with those kinds of situations. Yes, we do do the CIT training. Uh, 60 of our, of our 98 patrol officers right now have been through CIT training. We have a class scheduled starting on Monday. Um, and that class will 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 do 20 uh, police officers and deputy sheriffs um, in in our community. But that's just that's just touching the iceberg. The officers are spending more time on those calls. Used to be uh, when I first got here, we had a mental health facility. Officers were able to transport um, these these uh, people that were in crisis directly to that center turn them over to qualified staff and go back to their patrol duties. Now they're spending two, three, four hours trying to de-escalate the situation and it's become a tremendous burden on our, on our system. And uh, I mean, we're, we're spending an average of two to three hours on those particular calls. Now the addition of the second mobile crisis service has been very beneficial to us, although again, you know, if, if there's not a place to bring them, they're turned back out into the, into the community, then we're dealing with them again. And we're dealing with them multiple times. I mean, if you talk to the officers, they can name them, and they can tell you that they deal with them on a very regular basis. And a lot of times, de-escalating the situation takes a tremendous amount of time, it takes them from their other duties. Last year, we spent over 16,000 hours of police time 
that's how you get to the million dollars. <coughs> we spent over 16,000 hours of police time dealing with mental health personnel or, or citizens. It, it is definitely a crisis that we, the state, the county, every municipality, the hospital, Bryn Mawr, no one has a handle on it, and we're going to have to work together to get that handle. I, I definitely agree that the task force is a good idea, and I think one of the things that we need to look at is when we are asked as a community to, to provide the funds, we need to make sure that we're being asked to fund the same way that other communities are being asked. If Trillium is paying for this service in Wilmington, or if the state is paying for this service in Wilmington, those are our tax dollars, your tax dollars, my tax dollars that are doing that. So having a task force to look at the options, we're certainly, as a staff mayor, we certainly can support that. That's exactly what I'm looking for, you know, is to try to find a solution. I, I didn't say fund a solution, but, you know, to try to figure out what we're going to do, working together like that, I think we can come up with a better solution. Uh, one, one other thing I'd like to add about the task force is this. Uh, the reason uh, David Tart from Trillium had called Carteret County and Carteret County Hospital and because they were actually users of the facility when it was here, they, Carteret County wants back. They want the facility back here so they can use it. So my question to the, to the Board of Commissioners and to your uh, 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 chamber uh, council folks, do you want to involve uh, the mechanism of having the Carter County involved in the task force to think, see if they I can come up with the money? I because I think it has to be. We're not going to be able to do this. But you need a concerted effort. Everybody uses it has to and, fund and it in some uh, form or fashion. And the 1.6 million dollars operating cost. If if our, if we do have the funding to put this facility together. Uh, and a maintenance cost. This $1.6 million is an annual fee. It's not something we just pay one time and do. It's got to be funded every year. And when we have this stand-up facility, we can't turn away people from Jones County. We can't turn away people because if it's, if it's uh, uh, under the Trillium umbrella for uh, Medicaid, and they are our Medicaid, they're hired by the state to manage that Medicaid uh, money. We would have to allow anybody that's brought to that facility and take them in, not just Jacksonville or Onslow County people. So I'd like everybody to know that that's a possibility. Once you start a facility and it's uh, sanctioned by Division of Health out of Raleigh and uh, Trillium is their uh, management team, then we would have to accept people from wherever they got brought to from wherever. That's, that's also what needs to be looked at as far as examining that whole idea. You know, Absolutely. The task force. Mr. Willingham. I'd just like a little more information on the level of service. I understand our problem, as the police chief has explained, but it seems to be that there's a short-term problem, which we'll, we'll deal with law enforcement on uh, their calls and these incidents. And there's a long-term problem that um, Commissioner Knapp has, has mentioned, and you have mentioned, um, uh, Chairman Bright, when you talk about um, addressing the problem of the foster care uh, parent, of the parents of these children that into the foster care system. Um, the programs for um, uh, substance abuse that I was familiar with uh, were uh, recommended inpatient 90-day programs and things like this. So I would like to know more on what is envisioned as the, the level of service, uh, because I see two distinct problems. One is that emergency situation that's involving law enforcement, and these um, uh, people are being picked up, and they're treated at the hospital or taken to the jail. The other is a more long-term long situation. Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting point, because uh just to give an example of proper treatment, um, we've had kids that were uh, taken away uh, because they become unstable at home. And some of them, and I, I'm not going to mention any names, but some of them were actually pyrotechnics uh, or, or 
pyromaniacs. They set fires. Mm -hmm. But then Trillium, in order to save money, they were putting them in a facility of a group home. And you don't put a, a kid or anybody that's a pyromaniac in a group home because they have set fires and burnt those down. So the, there needs to be some pressure put on Trillium in order to get the person the right treatment. Oslo Memorial had one man at the hospital out there for 45 days. They couldn't find a bed for him. And then when uh, we put pressure on Trillium uh, and started calling uh, the uh, state, state office, they found a bed for him right away. But the thing of it is uh, getting the person the right treatment at the right time, and that's a key thing, and getting the proper treatment. Just a quick question. Is there an opportunity with that? Should we have this center and it be funded and it be working properly? You mentioned that we would also be able to take insurance, uh, uh, people that would have insurance. Is there an opportunity for a profitable income stream? Should the program be a good program for people? Because there's people that do have insurance that still need a facility as well. Could there be an opportunity there? To, to have an additional yeah. revenue stream to support the services. I mean, you wouldn't turn somebody down that had insurance, I wouldn't think, or would you? Yeah, would you most you of the time, most the time that type of person, the person with the insurance is going to go to the Bryn Mawr Hospital or somewhere yeah, like that. Is that not right, uh, Sherry? Well, there's a, there's a glitch with that, too. Let's say that I have insurance, but my insurance carrier requires me to pay a deductible of $10,000. So if I go to a facility and they say, well, we're going to take you in, or oh, like Bryn Mawr, and I don't know if they do that or not, but if I, my deductible is $10,000, average person can't pull $10,000 out of their pocket to pay for the deductible. So that person is one of the people that fall through the crack that don't get any treatment at all. They've got insurance, so they don't qualify for Medicaid, and they don't qualify for Trillium because Trillium only manages Medicaid. And they go to a private facility and they say they can't afford the deductible. So that person is one of the people that fall through the crack. Um, it is a very, it's, I'm going to tell you, it's a very complicated, complex issue. It's a very expensive issue. And it's going to take a lot of hard thinking and task force folks to figure out what we need to do to get on track with what we need to so, to solve this problem. Jack, I was curious, where is the nearest similar type facility physically located to Jacksonville? So they're located um, in Wilmington and in Greenville. Those would be the closest to us. I heard people say there's no room <coughs> in and, and that kind of thing, so that's what they yeah. went into. Now, Cumberland, Cumberland County, Cumberland County, Elmer, and uh, Fayetteville, they put together a, a crisis center that's connected with to the, I think it's connected to the hospital there. And I think their their operating cost is right at $3 million a year, minus the building. Let me say something real quick to Councilman Lane. I see your point, and I agree with you somewhat. I think it's all excellent points. I think it's all related, in other words, they're like blurred lines. I think Chief Finero once said that. I mean, all of this is related, and we have to attack it. The problem that I have is it's like, you know, it's like having early symptoms, you know? And now we're at we're at stage four cancer right now with this. Now we're going to have to spend a lot more money to, and a lot more treatment, so to speak, to put this under get this under control. And I think a lot of the questions that we're asking right now is definitely uh, a prerequisite or an indication that we do need to have this task force where we can discuss these things in detail, kind of go through it with a with a fine tooth comb and try to fix this problem. Because if we don't, it's going to continue to escalate. It's going to get worse. Um, and, and God forbid we have any, you know, additional tragic deaths that we could have could have prevented. And that's my main concern. And when we talk about law enforcement, let me just say this. Law enforcement, you know, whether it's short term or long term, they're a part of this. They're a part of it, whether it's short term or long term, it's going to affect them, period. And, you know, and it's um, our primary concern is the treatment of these individuals and to, and to get them the, the uh, proper providers, et cetera. But when people start talking about the police department and they talk about the sheriff's department, it affects them too. And it comes down to an, uh, an officer slash deputy safety issue as well. When you have one man out there 
uh, trying to cover an incident that takes him away from his primary jurisdiction for three hours. He is now out of his area, which means someone else has to fill him. You know, God forbid he gets a, uh, an assistance call. So I think these are all things that, uh, that we could discuss in a uh, committee, and I'm, I'm all for that. Whoever, I think it was you, Mr. Warden. I think that's a great idea, and I think it's a great idea to provide oversight, too, of the providers that are here. The work group that you've already got together that includes all these different entities, is that where, does Jacksonville just need to come into that? Is that a proper venue to look at the cost for this? Uh... So that group, sir, has, has looked at the cost of running the facility and what the um, reimbursement makeup might be for that. And, and uh, Chief Unero did join us for our last meeting and I, I think we'll be able to attend. Um, my thought of what was asked, and maybe I'm wrong, is this would be more a, a group that actually could talk about the money that that the county might have available or the money that the city might have available was that what you were or any other part or any other partners and the whole nuts nuts and bolts of it how you're going to address the problem uh, you know look at the seriousness of the problem that we're facing you know chief uh, says we're spending a million dollars a year you know i know richard you say it's not dollars but time is money right and uh, you're taking you're taking away from something else you could be using that money for I mean, I think we need to look at where the solution lies, okay? It seems like a new task force might be trying to reinvent the wheel when you've already got something that's going. Well, maybe you just need to get the task on, what's on Who's on this task force? I mean, is this task force the same as what Richard's saying? I mean, the task force we want, we want something with teeth in it. Yeah. Is that got teeth or does it not? That's where I would go. Right. I mean, Sherry, you sit on that board. Do we need to have a different task force versus that board? I think, sir, that depends on the, the collective group's decision on who they send to the task force. For instance, I can't commit the county to dollars, um, but uh, Commissioner Knapp comes to that meeting as well, and he has more access to the commissioners as a group for, for what your pulse is on what sort of commitment the commissioners can make. So similarly, I'm sure Chief Unero probably isn't at the point where he wants to sign uh, for a, a specific IOU. Um, on the city's behalf, but that would be who, who does who does the city authorize or who does the county authorize to talk about money? Yeah, um, and so, yes, sir, it could be the same group or it may be a separate group, just depending on your preference of who you want to participate in it. To echo what she said, I do sit on that committee. And the committee to me is a different type of committee than the one you're talking about. You said it best, sink your teeth in it. And you know as well as I do with any like drug task force, you get other agencies in there, there's more of an impact because I think we have two, we have two different sections here so to speak okay you have the committee that we sit in that talks about the policies talks about the providers etc for trillium okay our committee would be separate from that running parallel in other words we'd be talking about funding we'd be talking how to work uh together how to get the services and how to get the funding okay we try to do that in that particular meeting we won't get out of there for five hours <laughs> so i think they're they're two separate entities kind of working parallel together and uh, perfect choice of words. You know, I think our uh, task force that uh, Bob originally mentioned earlier would, would have some teeth, and we can use that uh, to our benefit to help the citizens, and that's ultimately the main goal, is to help our citizens get the services they need. One of the key things that, sorry, go ahead, sir. One of the key things that we need to remember here is we need to thank Chief Unero and the sheriff, but Chief Unero has been very instrumental in the CIT training. They weren't, Trillion weren't doing anything. Trillian came back in, we did one class, and it was a nightmare for both me and the chief. So what we did was the chief come to me and he said, well, why don't we do it ourselves? And that's what we did. Then Trillian said we couldn't use their lesson plans. Well, then the state said, yes, we could. But then Trillian said we had to get their logo off of the darn lesson plans. <laughs> so, you know, but the thing about it is, is chief has really pushed that hard, and we've run, like you said, 60-some people through the sheriff's department, along with chief's personnel and the officers throughout the county. There's 24 going to sit in class on Monday morning. We're running that program through Chief Unero as instructors. I would suggest a course of action. First of all, for the public, CIT stands for? Crisis Intervention Training. Yes, Crisis Intervention Training. I would suggest that you authorize the county manager and myself to work on an outline of what a task force would accomplish, that that be circulated with the two elected bodies. If you agree with that outline, then we can work to determine how the staffing of that could be accomplished. Then you can decide as elected officials whether you want to appoint one person, two persons, that, that would be up to you. There are basically, I, I think, you know, I like to think in round numbers, nine. 
That's a round number, isn't it, Mayor? <laughs> round it up. Okay. Now, I think that there's some basic questions that David and I can lay out and provide you the answers with that will help determine the scope that the task force needs to be focused on. And if the two chairmen tonight are, are supportive of that, I'm sure David and I can come up with that within a reasonable time period. I'm good with that. That's kind of course I want. I'm good with it. Council. Here. <clears throat> okay. Sounds like y'all got some work cut out for In the interest of time, and, and we will keep everyone, uh, all interested parties, up to date on our progress, uh, I, I would like to ask Dr. Woodruff and, and his staff to uh, uh, take on the downtown Jacksonville update the uh, parking opportunities. <coughs> We have a short video and Ryan King and Anthony Prince are going to work us through from a planning and transportation standpoint. Gentlemen, make it quick, please. Good evening, Chairman. Uh, Board of Commissioners, Mayor, City Council. Uh, not quite a video, but we'll, we'll go through a PowerPoint here. Speaking of task force, that's a great lead in. Back in 2013, the City Council and County Commissioners appointed two members of the respective boards to a joint study committee. And those uh, elected officials, along with the county staff, and city staff met on about seven occasions to discuss planning issues on how to revitalize the downtown and continue those efforts. Uh, city, county staff both presented information to, to the elected folks. We participated in a walking tour to talk about issues that, that we're facing in our downtown area. And we came up with a draft report and recommendations on where to move forward. And some of that I'm going to demonstrate tonight on kind of what we've done and then Anthony's going to uh, pick up where I leave off on some of those things. So some of the key questions and I know it's already been mentioned tonight is what to do with the waterfront area. One of the big things that we talked about is can we go underground with power lines because I'll show you here in a few minutes that it makes a huge um, visual difference when you get rid of the overhead power lines. Uh, what to do about Court Street. There was a lot of discussion on one way, two way, um, a plaza and things like that on, on how to deal with that situation. Another big component is with the pedestrian traffic in and around the courthouse is how do we make it safer for our pedestrians in the area. Parking, that's always uh, a, key, a key issue with the uh, how do we improve that and I'll give you an update on one of those items here in just a moment. How do we bring private investment into downtown? Is there any opportunities or options available for funding these improvements? And what incentives can we do or create to attract private sector to uh, invest their dollars in downtown? Um, over the years, we've had multiple studies of the downtown. We started back in 1986. We had the first downtown plan. And then in 1998, Allison Platt um, did an update to that plan. And then once again, in 2007, it was a joint city council and county commissioner um, hired the Lawrence Group to come in and, and kind of continue to tweak that. And then 2011, city staff uh, basically studied the parking in and around a quarter mile of the courthouse. And here recently, Anthony and his staff, you know, expanded upon that a little bit more further than the quarter mile, and, and he'll talk to you about that here in a moment. So we wanted to focus tonight on some accomplishment. What's been done since we met uh, in 2013, and the, the justice complex has been completed. Uh, the Center for Public Safety, sorry, I got a little ahead of myself there. And the, uh, the realignment of Court Street, that's something that a lot of those plans had identified over the, the last uh, you know, 10, 20 years to realign Court Street, which has been done, and we've signalized that intersection there. The Freedom Fountain, you know, to replace the, the one that was at the, uh, for the, the justice complex, and, and what an asset to the community that's become. The demolition that, the, that has occurred in the downtown area, I know that uh, we're getting close to the 100, the 100 structure mark in the last five years that, uh, where we've torn down buildings. And before you leave that, Paul Buchanan was actually driving, true story, he was actually <laughs> driving that excavator, and the mayor was too, when they started taking that building down. Ryan, go ahead. So speaking of parking, you know, one of the future um, areas that we've identified for possible parking in the downtown areas where this building uh, was sitting before Commissioner Buchanan and, and Mayor Phillips decided they were going to get there on the Caterpillar. 
Um, bicycle gallery, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how long um, they've been here, but you know, they've, they've been thriving in downtown and, and have stayed there and, and we're glad to have them in downtown. The partnership between the city, the county, the state on, on the, the boat landing. I went by, it's Monday afternoon about 3, 3.30, and there was a dozen cars at least sitting there on this beautiful Monday um, using this facility that, that couldn't have happened without the efforts of all three groups. Um, the work that's going on, the Consolidated Human Services building that I imagine is getting pretty close to phase one being completed. And uh, the city of Jacksonville has, has now taken ownership over the, the marina, the old Kerr Street Marina that we're, we're referencing as uh, Riverwalk Marina now and, and possible um, things that may come there with the marina for boat slips and things of that nature. The courthouse expansion, you know, they're out there getting the, getting the soils uh, stabilized so they can begin to go vertical there on that site. New Bridge Street improvements, and, and Anthony will give you some slides on, on some ideas on how that, that may work and um, the Ann Street Park property, the, the area between the bridges along the waterfront and, and what may be able to happen there. Thomas Street Park, and it opens tomorrow. They were in the process of rolling the sod down there today and uh, landscaping's in and, and I've been told that that will open tomorrow. So an additional, that second phase of the park and where the old tax office building was located, that, that should be available for public to use that tomorrow. We leave that slide. Quite often we hear that the city and the county don't work together. Every one of those projects is in some fashion a joint partnership. Every one of those things is becoming a reality because the county commission and the city council have worked together. Whether that was joint funding, whether it was regula regulatory changes to allow your inspectors to do certain things or whether it's a direct city project. Tallman Street, great example. And again, I believe that's what, 75 parking spaces that will be added to the downtown because of that cooperation, please. Yeah. It's, it's been a few years since we had that plan approved, but. It's a good number. It's a good number. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we also talked about was just visioning. And sometimes, you know, it's little things that can make a big difference. This is a current slide of Court Street looking towards the Justice Complex and just adding some, some um, pedestrian areas on both sides and adding some additional landscaping, you can really change the way that that area would be more inviting and, and, and beautify those areas. I mentioned before making the sidewalks wider in order to provide uh, safer areas for our pedestrians to access the courthouse and, and narrowing the roads so that people have a tendency to slow down. The, here's an example of the overhead power lines you can see here on the left. And then when we do away with it, I mean, what a difference, you know, something as simple as hiding the overhead power can make, and then also creating some, some pedestrian improvements. Mm -hmm. Once again, eliminating some of the overhead utilities, it just, you know, cleans it up. The additional pedestrian improvements there along New Bridge Street. Another example of, uh, you know, some work, some brick work that could be done there at the intersection right at the courthouse. Here's an example of the area directly across from the Superior Courthouse where the existing building and parking is located. And one of the things that we looked at was a square that is in Raleigh that, you know, you could create a, a public square, vegetation, landscaping to really kind of make a central focus point in our downtown area as one example. And then the area between the bridges and, and the courthouse expansion that uh, is ongoing now that, that's on the right and then what may happen between the bridges along Ann Street and provide opportunities for people to, to enjoy the water that's right there um, along that, that area. And that's all that I have this evening and thank you for the time and be happy to answer any questions that the board of commissioners or county. City Council may have. In the interest of time, let's uh, hold off on questions. I know that we all have appointed two members to continue to work with two members from City Council. The two from City Council, I believe, are Mr. Willingham and Mayor Pro Tem Lazaro. And uh, David, who did y'all appoint? Myself and Mark Price. 
Okay, mm -hmm. great. And we'll be bringing you all, uh, hopefully having a meeting in the near future so we can uh, look at additional opportunities. At this point, we'd like to talk about downtown parking opportunities that are going to be important to both the county and the city, and also talk to you about the four block area from the Freedom Fountain down to the middle school on some, some specific activities that we're currently discussing with those property owners. Anthony? Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I know that the uh, city council members as well as our TAC members know that I struggle with brevity, but uh, I'm going to try to move through this presentation as, as quickly as I possibly can. Continuing with the concept of vision, I want to just present to you some of the concepts that we're considering for revitalizing New Bridge Street. At some point in the very near future, the city is going to have to go in and, and tear up the street in order to um, reconstruct some of our existing utilities. They're starting to get some age on them and they need to be replaced. So with that, that provides an, a, a great opportunity for us to consider reinventing the streetscape as a whole, if in fact that's something that we want to do. The first concept you might have saw when we present to this, presented to the City Council in December. This is what I call the serpentine two-lane street. And basically what it is, it's a horizontal shift in the roadway uh, at, at certain periods along the way to help slow traffic down as it goes down the street. You know, one of the things that we struggle with right now is the fact that Newbridge is pinned straight and it's also really wide. Because of that, the chief and others, uh, they have a very challenging time enforcing the speed limit down there because the road is simply so wide and it's designed to encourage higher speeds. So with this serpentine type of pattern, we're hoping that the shift would discourage the higher speeds, but it also encourages or it creates the opportunity for narrower pedestrian crossings. And one of the things that the downtown committee would really like to see us try to encourage uh, with the bulb outs. You can see at the corners and at the mid-block crossings, we have areas where the curb extends, it narrows the crossing distance so that the pedestrians can be seen as they're crossing, and it also you know, shortens the amount of time that they're in the roadway. One thing on the screen here that we've uh, gotten a lot of feedback on is the roundabout. And uh, I wouldn't say that there's been a lot of positive feedback on the roundabout. It's, it's not necessarily the most traditional type of, of treatment for an intersection, but the, the concept itself, none of these concepts hinge on having the roundabout or not. That's something that definitely could be left out of the final plan. You can see a perspective here. The bulb outs that I mentioned before shorten the pedestrian crossing. Uh, we have some sidewalk cafes, enhanced landscaping. Of course, you can see the city hall in, in the background there. Another one of our concepts is to install a center median. Uh, this concept right here, this image shows the median extending the entire length of, of the block in front of City Hall. And based upon discussions with stakeholders and, and others in the community, um, what we're looking at now is, is instead of having a continuous island like that, of course we still maintain the, uh, the, the angle parking and the pedestrian ball bounce to shorten the crossing. But instead of having a, continue, a continuous island, what we might consider are shorter islands periodically along the corridor that help to you know, beautify the area and control traffic, slow people down, et cetera. But in between those islands, we might use the center area for commercial pickup and drop off, or we might even use that area for on-street parking. There's enough space out there on the roadway that really it's, it's our, whatever our choice is. You know, we, we've got plenty of space out there to do any of those options. You can see that we've got some, some brick treatments there with the concrete, the curbing, as well as the sidewalk. Here's another example where you're adding street trees. Got a decorative crosswalk there. And then here's another option you know, similar to the others, but it does not include any landscaping. It's complete hardscape. So with our final concept, the intent here is to widen the sidewalk so you'd essentially bring the edge line of the road out towards the center. 
we maintain the angle parking, maintain the pedestrian bulb outs, but instead of having the landscaping in the center of the roadway, you would push it towards the sidewalk itself. Now there are certain challenges with this option, mainly because if, if you go and you start moving the edge line of the road towards the center, you end up having to regrade the entire roadway in order to get the drainage that you need for stormwater. So of these, this is probably the most challenging to construct. But it has its pros and cons, just like the others. Here you can see a wide sidewalk. This is similar to the concept um, that was shown on the previous slide, where you had the street trees towards the on-street parking, the pedestrian way up towards the buildings. Some brick treatment there. Same, same thought with the street trees near the parking. You can see there's angle parking in this shot. And here's one of the bulb outs that I was talking about. Uh, the benefit again is that you're getting the pedestrian further out towards the travel way without actually them standing in the road so that the distance that they have to cross is shorter. And also they're closer to the vehicles as they approach so the vehicles can see them when they cross. So in the theme of improving pedestrian safety, these are definitely some of the treatments that we would like to see. The fourth concept that I don't have any slides on, of course, is to basically leave it the way that it is. You know, we leave it a four lane section, uh, angle parking, maybe go in there and, and do some, some landscaping enhancements, but by and large, we'd leave the traffic pattern the same. The input from the business and property owners was for the center median, but for the center median not to be continuous. Let's move real quickly to parking op opportunities. Yes, sir. Ryan mentioned in 2011 that we did a downtown parking study. And at that time, the justice complex was not complete and, and neither was the Center for Public Safety. So some of the data here is a little bit, it's got a little bit of age on it, but it shows you the concept of, of what we found and, and what is likely occurring out there today. Uh, we found that there was 530 public off-street parking spaces. Mm -hmm. Those are spaces either owned by the city or the county that are available for the public to park at any time. Uh, when we surveyed those parking spaces, we found that on average about 60% of them were occupied. Okay, and, and, and what's a little bit misleading, that's just a little bit over 50%, but what's misleading about that is that the occupancy rates at some of the key destinations were much, much higher, approaching the 100% mark. And those are in the areas of the courthouse, the post office, city hall, the usual suspects where everybody wants to park in, in the downtown area. The study came up with a whole list of recommendations. Of those, the first was to improve what we already have. Uh, pay parking lots that are currently gravel, uh, stripe in parking where it may not be striped today to help with the efficiency, and then also, um, improve signage around the parking areas so that people know that it's public and wayfinding signage also to help them get to that location so that they can utilize uh, existing parking. It also recommended that we look at adding some either on-street or off-street parking near those key destinations. We'll look at that here in just a second. But one of the underlying themes of the study was is that we need to look for opportunities or partnership opportunities. Um, there are a variety of different assets downtown that are available for this purpose right here. And maybe by partnering together, whether it's the city and the county or whether it's a government agency and a private property owner, um, it'll be a lot easier for us to provide for the parking that we need together than uh, as individuals, as individual organizations. So we updated the 2011 study based upon current conditions. And what you're seeing on the map here is just a, a simple GIS exercise that identifies where the existing parking is, uh, where some potential off-street parking locations may be, and then where we would also want to go in and, and potentially add some on-street parking. So you see the, the Center for Public Safety as well as the uh, Justice Complex show up on this map. Uh, we've got pretty good coverage in that area, 
But you can also see that over there where it says 56, 20, 43, 86, there are some additional property available, you know, at some point, if at some point we want to pursue it. Uh, there are also properties available down towards Riverwalk Park, if we so choose. But uh, the main thing here is, is to take away that this is just a simple GIS analysis. We really haven't vetted any of this in detail. We certainly haven't talked to any of the property owners, but again, the potential is there. One thing before you leave the map, if you look at the Marine Boulevard, the 143, the green space of 143, that's immediately adjacent to the lots that the city and the county own together. Those are areas that in time, certainly we're not ready for a parking garage today, but those are areas in time we need to look seriously at trying to determine how do we acquire them because of the proximity. What we know is people simply do not walk. The study that Anthony mentioned, 60%, well, if you're within a block and a half of the courthouse, it's 100%. But if you're three and a half blocks away, it's down to 20 or 30 percent. People don't walk. These are opportunities that I would hope that over the next year that David and his staff is, are authorized to work with the city staff to bring you back potential solutions. In the interest of time, I think we will uh, stop at this point. I thank the staff. David, I know that you, let's leave this, this graphic up because this graphic does have to do with the conversion. So do you want to cover the status of the conversion? So that we're not reinventing the wheel and uh, speaking with dr woodruff um, there there is we we have the uh, jacksonville downtown Revi revitalization uh, committee and i would recommend that we put that question of what to do uh, with that property um, come back with options to to both bodies with uh with opportunities to to use that property um in, in the future it, it may be uh, public-private partnership it may be parking um, but put that to that committee to study and and bring that back before the two bodies all right great that's turn it back over to the uh, chairman and the mayor Well, we have a section here uh, open for any commissioner or council comments, and I'll ask any of the council members here if you have any comments to make at this time. Well, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to meet, but yeah, look forward to it again sometime. We need yeah. to have more of these sessions. Yeah, I agree with you. Any commissioner comments? I just want to say thanks. I think this is long overdue. Um, I was excited. When uh, the commissioner told me that, uh, or the chairman had told me that this had been initiated, I think this is going to uh, uh, help our relationship, you know, as, as, as one entity for the citizens. So, really excited about working <coughs> with you guys. I do. First, Go ahead. The first step in cooperation is communication. So, we're so glad you all are here. We appreciate you being here and, and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Yeah, I, I do think uh, the. This is the start of uh, the con uh, meetings that we can meet with all the municipalities because each municipality has their own unique uh, 
problems and things that they want to be able to work with the county on and we are going to schedule those meetings sometime with uh, different municipalities and there may be some things that uh, we're doing that we can combine or consolidate and uh, now is the time to really look at ways to save money because we don't know what's coming down the pipe from the state on legislation that's going to take revenue and funding away from us. Uh, so, and there's a lot of ifs and unknowns about that. So anytime we can uh, provide the quality of service that we need to provide and do it for less money, I think we need to do that. I think we need to look at that. Because we, we all in this together and I was reflect back on the uh, Carter County. Uh, they were very willing to participate in the mental health and uh, the two hospitals are, are very willing to participate at uh, what level, I don't know. But uh, in order to fix a regional problem, you're gonna have to have regional input. And it's not just a region, it's nationwide, it's statewide about mental health. And I think we had a very, very productive meeting and discussion today and got a lot of things out on the table that needed to be said and needed to be done. But you, uh, and I, like uh, Vice Chair Bennett said, communication is the key here. And uh, you need the right hand talking to the left hand so you don't duplicate services. No need to duplicate services. I, I just uh, want to be a part of that. But thank you for coming, uh, Mayor and uh, Council. Um, I think we've got a good working relationship. Uh, we've got two good managers. We've got two very good attorneys. <laughs> and we got... Uh, we don't uh, want them to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> might be trying to get our job. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I thank you all for coming, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to sit down and uh, uh, go over these uh, issues that... It's pretty much uh, issues that we all have. We just uh, a lot of times you just don't realize it. I, I will speak on behalf of the council. I, I want to thank you all for hosting it tonight. You all have this beautiful building, all this beautiful scenery out here. It's distracting being able to look out into the living. But, uh, thank you very much for hosting us. Um, this this could be the start of something really good to, to continue these meetings, you know, periodically to get together and discuss some things because it's better to work together than just to get in each other's way. So I think that uh, I think we're on to something here. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. So with that, who we adjourn? We we have an adjournment over here. Uh, second. second, council. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So then, <laughs> that, that was pretty quick. <laughs> Any discussion on that? <laughs> we are adjourned.